here and here. You know, some of the most, um, some of the most life-changing, um, culture-moving events uh, happen not because somebody had a bright idea. But a doctor told me once that, that the group that had done more for uh, our standard of living and health were plumbers, <laughs> not doctors. So here's a very significant date, 1347. In that year, uh, 30 to 40 percent of the whole population of Europe died in one year in the plague. That is a most significant event for lots of reasons, and it's not at all um, unrelated that in England the Peasant Revolt happened in 1381. Um, hitherto completely unthought of, not a possibility, and this thing just happened. Um, the Black Death changed everything because labour was suddenly in short supply. So peasants could, for the first time in history, so I'm not doing that. Somebody's going to pay me more money to do this. Absolutely epoch uh, marking time. So that's 34 for up to 40% in one year, and the death, the, the plague lasted some years. It was the most incredible part of history. Um, uh, Gutenberg invents the press. We're, you know, we're working our way towards modernity. Um, and that is a highly significant thing. Um, back in 1381, uh, the Bible was translated into English. That may not seem all that significant to you, but it really was. Because part of the church's authority was, you guys are all uneducated, and we, the educated class, will just tell you how to think. And, and so, um, so this translation into English of the Bible was amazing. Um, Hussite Wars, I just noted that because long before the actual Reformation, there was uh, groups of people who were unhappy with uh, Christendom. And, and there were revolts and there were wars and it was kind of not friendly. Um, can't read my little writing. Oh yeah, um, what's the name of all taken by uh, the terms? Um, and that's the final form. So the eastern side of the of the empire lasted a lot longer than the western side. Um, what else? What else? Done, I think. Christopher Columbus, 1492. When we start again, we'll go to start at uh, Luther, the Reformation, and what's often called the Age of Reason. But let's let's go to. I have to walk past that. <laughs> All right, I got it here. Maybe this this will do. This will do. <clears throat> um, this is really interesting. So the Aquinas is back here, twelve twenty-five thereabouts, and the Crusades have happened, and there's a whole new optimism that's starting to grow. Um, and, and that optimism is really sparked by the knowledge that came back from the Muslim world. So Aquinas uh, rediscovers Aristotle and Christianizes him. Um, Aquinas' epistemology, how do you know what you know? He says, you need God's help to know anything, but uh, uh, humankind does have a natural capacity to know some things. Now, that probably doesn't sound very revolutionary to you, but to say that there is a natural capacity to know, that, you, that we know some things just by nature, was a big, huge, monumental Copernican shift. So, uh, so, and it's very important to know because next time it's become absolutely key that the way you know uh, what can be naturally known is through your senses. <coughs> All right? 
Okay. Okay. You mentioned before that everything happens for a reason along this, along this line. Yeah. Does it happen for a reason or because of a reason? Yeah, I, I get your question. I, I, I'm not saying it happens for a reason. I'm just saying history is never in a vacuum. That's all I really want to say. Um, everything reacts to everything and everything's related to everything. So um, I'm not saying this is coming to some great dramatic end. Um, I'm just saying this is the way it went. And when we get to the end, you'll see how we got there. That's all. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you can know what can be naturally known through your senses and what you can't know through your senses needs to come to you by divine revelation for Thomas that is uh, through the scripture um, so he says there is a light given to man by which God accordingly uh, gives to man by his nature humans understanding has a form sufficient for knowing intelligible things in other words um, the highest part of the person if you remember Aristotle is your reason and uh, for Thomas humankind is a reasoning animal we are animals who reason and we've, by the time we get to Thomas philosophy is all about reason it's all about thinking so it's about knowledge so that which is intelligible uh, we can work out through our ordinary senses let's talk a bit about ethics ethics is is applied philosophy how how you live. Um, so, do you remember we were talking about virtue when we were talking about Aristotle? Um, do you want to do a quick? I have to run past there again. Yeah, yeah. You bring it up there. We'll save everybody. See you. Beautiful. You'll you'll really see the connection between Aristotle. And at St. Thomas. Um, <clears throat> uh, with Aristotle, you have a pleasure of the sensual type, aesthetic type of beauty, and pleasure of the mind. So it's prioritizing the mind. It's exactly what Thomas does. So in the soul for Aristotle, you have the appetite, the gut, those things that satisfy your gut. Uh, you have spirit, which is uh, the virtues like courage and so on. And the highest part of the soul is the reason. So, you know, this, therefore, in an ideal society, your king would be a philosopher because he reasons and thinks. Is that cool? Um, <coughs> do you remember the causes? Um, Thomas picks up these causes exactly, except that he had the category first cause. So Aristotle says a thing is caused by its um, material cause, efficient cause, formal cause, and final cause. You remember all this? Yeah. Um, and St. Thomas adds first cause, which of course is God. Um, final cause, you know, Thomas says, uh, I worry about this. Yeah. For Thomas, virtue denotes the perfection of a power. A thing's perfection is known by its end. I don't know if this sounds like double dutch, but what he means by its end is the purpose for which it's there. So uh, he says every everything is determined by its end cause. So you know, why do we have eyebrows? Well, we have eyebrows to keep out the fly, shake our eyes or something. When I was studying this stuff donkeys years ago, Somebody put their hand up and said, why do men have nipples? That's <laughs> a good question, really, isn't it? I don't know why do men have nipples. Why? <laughs> Decoration. It's 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 why. It's <laughs> because you're, because you're in the womb, the nipples are actually formed before the gender. So there's still a chance that because male, male is XY. There you go. So you should have been in one class. The end of every power for Thomas is, is act. So Thomas says, God is pure act. Or another way he says it is, there is no potential in God. 
So the only way you can know God is by participation. It's, it's an activity. You become a human being when you act for the good. Does that make sense? So God is pure act. So to sit on your chair and think up categories of God is not, it's not you know God. You know God by action. You know, so we use the word participation. So um, all actions are for some good. Thomas, every human action is for some good. I think this helps him here. Now that doesn't mean to say every human action is moral, but it's always for some good. If I need to provide for my family, and that's what I need to do when I shoot you to get your money, I'm acting for a good when I want to provide for my family. The problem is that act isn't moral because I deny the good of life in order to get the good of financial security for my family. So every act is for a good, which means you can justify every act. If you want to. Yeah. You might say for satisfaction, good is Well for Thomas, for Thomas, this good isn't a selfish thing. It's it's not an inner deal. In order to get into discussions where it's all about your inner self, we have to wait till next week when we get modern and it's all very... <laughs> I'm not a big fan. Anyway, um, <laughs> in this point in history, the good is still a, a greater good than me. And every human action is towards some degree. Um, he would say uh, good is, is um, uh, multiple. We'll find our way eventually. Um, this is real. I'm just stretching my memory a bit here now. Um, uh, good of life, good of health, uh, friendship. I think one of them is religion. I think one of them is play. The seven of them. Love. Love. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I think actually the way you would say it is love is, has got to be all of these. And I, I forget now what the other categories were, but I'll think of them on the way home. Um, so what, what he's, you know, the good is multiple. And, and in order for you to participate in the good, there has to be multiple things happen. So a fanatic is somebody who takes one good and calls it the whole good. Uh, it's not what it is. But, you know, a religious person who says the only good in the world is, is religion uh, becomes a fanatic if they deny the good of friendship, the good of health, the good of play. Often, you know, next time we meet, I'll know the others. So the good is, is a you know, slightly complex kind of discussion. Um, So you work out what's moral by asking what good is being denied, not, not what good are you acting towards. Does that make sense? And that's still, you know, that's Thomas, we're talking 1200. That is still Catholic theology today. It's still with us. So this guy, his influencing history is absolutely amazing. Um, <coughs> So let's talk about the virtues. Remember how I talked last time about for, for uh, Aristotle, virtue is the mean between two extremes. So courage is, is the middle point between doesn't give a shit and scared to death. Courage is somebody that has a mix of those. Um, and every virtue is, is, a, is a middle point between two extremes. So he says there are four virtues which are natural <coughs> To, uh, to human beings by virtue of them being alive. Prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude. Everybody in the world with breath should be able to work those out as being virtues to aspire to. Um, 
Now, with, with Aristotle too, he did contemplate uh, a human person that had no soul, or whose soul was so corrupt that they, they, um, his work was they, they were brutes, they were animals. So he, he could believe in capital punishment because there would be such a thing as a brute, which is not a human person. It's not that they are the devil, it's just that they so lack humanity that they're not human. I'm not saying I buy that, but it's, it's an interesting position to take. So he says that the virtues of faith are uh, faith, hope and charity, which is love which you, you can only learn through divine revelation, through God. Um, what's on the other side of this? No, okay. All right. Um, now, the reason that we've gone this, this direction is, in the Western world at least, there is no such thing as a non-Christian thinker in the in this thousand years. It didn't exist. It really didn't exist. The power of the church was so overwhelming. Um, uh, and, and we need to kind of get that to begin to understand that when the age of reason came, it was like it's, it's, it's the biggest kind of agony and uh, you could say a birth in a way, um, where to shake off the authority of the church and kings, um, kings got their authority from the church. So to shake off the authority of the king, to shake the authority of the church, um, people were still kings were still calling themselves um, holy Roman emperors because because the pope would say, okay, you're a holy Roman emperor. Um, I was in England once and uh, there was this box in this place just somewhere near um, Shakespeare's place there, the council owned a flat, a uh, house which they preserved, which you could go and see. And I, there was this box and I nearly sat on it. And then I found out its date was 1066. <laughs> and it was this old box with a slot at the top and it was worn <coughs> out from where peasants used to put coins in. And that was carried to Rome. That was, that was taxation time. Incredible, isn't it? Incredible. Um, okay, I think we might just throw it open and see if we've got any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to get stuck somewhere. What do you think? Um, the, the purpose of you doing this history lesson is because all philosophical thought occurs in the context of, <coughs> of time and place. Abs absolutely. Philosophy is a history-bound subject. It all happens in a time and place. I'm definitely this idea of evil being the absence of good, which I actually think is really a good concept. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of the Christian tradition, um, how does that fit in with where did the idea of Satan come from and, and was that not a challenge to that Christian idea of theology that... Um, yes and no. Um, this, in the day we live in, in fundamentalist circles, Star Wars theology still wins. So you have Satan as an equal and opposite, almost, which is not a biblical idea, um, but it's, it's a popular idea. Um, so, but it's it's just as easy to read that. I mean, Satan. Satan is a Hebrew word. It's the, it's an ordinary Hebrew word that means I accuse. So when you accuse somebody of something, you're doing the work of Satan. It's just a normal word. Satan. <laughs> I accuse. Um. So it's a, you know it's it's. That's all it is. If you, if you, and I apologise for being religious tonight because you know what, you know we're in the medieval period. Laura had a brilliant 
idea, but we thought about it too late. We thought we should have made everybody come kind of dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Leave your swords at the door. <laughs> How good would have that been? <laughs> that would have made you catch it a bit. Um, yeah, look, if you, if you flip your way through the Bible from one end to the other, the Satan or devil, the other lost, hardly gets a mention. Hardly that. Now, if you, if, you, if you talk to fundamentalists now, you see demons under every bed, uh, you would think that it was just kind of full of it, but it's actually remarkably not. And so when did that idea, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not Christian, so I'm not very yep. good at theology at all, but the, my, um, the sort of the stuff that you read about in James Joyce, not where he talks about going to Catholic primary school, being told about going to hell for yeah. talking in class and stuff, yeah. Yeah. where does that sort of power, because like, that's a very powerful concept. Yeah. And, when does that enter into Christianity? Yep. That idea of but evil as as an equal and opposite, as opposed to just an absence. Um, it's it's there all along, but it, it sort of gets popular and less popular. Um, it it um, in the late Middle Ages, it really reaches a bit of a high point. Actually, once again, when the world shakes, that this comes back, um, and so. Uh, People who feel like their world is crumbling, you know, in a way, need a Satan and they need a hell because all these people who are driving me crazy deserve hell. Um, and, and so there is a need, you know, we want somebody to get bloody punished for all this shit. Um, so uh, that's, that's what happens in times of uncertainty. Um, also, fundamentalism rises as the, as the world becomes wobbly um, and when we finally get to postmodernism you'll see that postmodernism and fundamentalism actually do belong together yeah I don't know that I really believe that, that in the West there's only young Christian figures there must have been um, on some female centers, um, groups uh, within groups in a place like you know, I just don't believe that there's no uh, female figures is possibly beginning to early cults we can yeah, yeah, well, what well, I'm talking about Western philosophy. You believe in the West, in, in, in England? The, in yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, the Vikings that came over were Christian, the Saxons that yeah. came over were Christian, and, you know, and all of that sort of stuff, but um, they soon got Christianized, and, and none of them were recorded in history for their thinking. You know, the ones that survived were the, <laughs> these powerful uh, Westerners. Um, I should have told you. This is all, there's somebody asked me about women. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we just reach a craft and all the, yep. that's very anti-Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, going back to Augustine, wherever it is, way back in the foundations of all this, um, Augustine 